where is the church? What does it mean to be Catholic? And who says? These are some of the questions that my guest this week, Tish Oxenreiter, was asking on her journey into the Catholic faith. Yes, this is her conversion story, and it's a fantastic one. I feel very blessed, very privileged to bring this to you. We, we chat about how her and her husband began as, as church planning missionaries and came back to the States and became Anglican and felt really at home in this community, this Anglican church that lifted up Christ and, and worshipped him in what felt like a very right context, a holy sacramental context in the way that he should have been lifted up and worshipped, but still longed for something more, something deeper, and began looking into the, the root of the Christian church, the, the roots of, of Christianity, and found these people called the saints and, and these early church fathers and writers like Augustine and, and Irenaeus and these, these early figures. And they began to sound awfully Catholic. And as they dug deeper into this history and found more Catholic authors and began looking into what Catholics believed from, from Catholic sources, much like I did in, in my own journey, they began to see the sense, the, the logic, the compellingness, the truth of the Catholic church. From that beauty to the goodness through the church as uh, the, the truth, <laughs> the, tr- <laughs> the truth, as Tish says. It's a fantastic story and resonates deeply with me. I hope if you are an evangelical or Anglican on this journey, looking for the truth in Christianity, willing to ask these questions, and this video will be deeply resonant with you too. If you are already a convert like myself, I hope this video really helps you to explore some of those thoughts as well, and resonates and encourages you too in where you are. It's a fantastic story, and I'm very pleased to bring it to you. It's wonderful. And really, it it surrounds the question of submission, which I know is a strange thing to talk about in evangelical circles, the idea of, of submitting to something. But here we are, finding this ancient church, and if we can accept that it is what it says that it is, and submitting to that, it's a very freeing, exciting, and authentic way of doing our faith. I hope you see that in this discussion and, and pick it on that too. Please, please watch. Please be edified. And gosh, it's a lot of fun. So please enjoy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening on podcasts, we're also on YouTube, this newfangled YouTube thing at youtube.com slash the cordial Catholic to watch what you're hearing here. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you. Please subscribe to this channel and like this video so other people see it and find us on podcasts as well. Uh, the cordial Catholic, wherever fine podcasts are found and even not so fine podcasts. I'm amongst, I'm not sure which crowd I fit into, but I'm there. So find us there, please. This is going to be a fantastic episode this week. Uh, I just I just know it. I'm joined by Tish Oxenrider. She's the author of several books, including Liturgical Guides, Bitter and Sweet for Lent and Shadow and Light for Advent, as well as At Home in the World, the story about her family, uh, family's year traveling around the world out of backpacks. She's a podcaster, writes a long-running newsletter, which is fantastic, leads pilgrimages, and helps people create their own rule of life. And for our purposes here today, she has a fantastic conversion story to tell. Tish, I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome to the show and hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's so fun. It's It feels like my worlds are converging because I am <laughs> such a longtime listener of your own show. Well, listen, that's a huge compliment in and of itself. So thank you. And I'm sorry. I don't know why you subject yourself <laughs> to that kind of thing, but it's a nice compliment to hear. Uh, I am really thrilled to have you because I mean, I followed you not literally on Twitter, which I feel a bit bad about. I, I realized that I did not follow you and you were following me, which is shocking. So I'm sorry. I fixed that now. But you I know, I, it you. kept me up late at night. <laughs> yeah, I was I'm like sure. wringing my hands. Uh-huh. I'm sure it did. Why isn't he following me? <laughs> I have followed you in your work for a while. And when I when I heard that you had made the journey into the Catholic Church, I was excited. I was shocked. I was surprised. And I thought I have to get you on the show to tell your story. So I'm so pleased to have you. And I really want you just to tell your story and then we'll dig into some places where we find some interesting material and, and, and maybe tease a bit more out, but maybe start from the beginning as far back as you want to go and tell us a bit about your faith journey and I'll yeah. kind of get out of the way. Okay. Well, you know, um, when I, when we first announced that we, um, 
converted when we became Catholic. This was February 2021. I jokingly said that people probably had a wide variety of reactions, one of which is just complete shock and awe. Um, and those are probably the people that knew me like in my youth group years, my heyday of high school. <laughs> um, and the people who maybe were just readers who found me within the past year probably thought I already was Catholic. So <laughs> there was like the spectrum that I guessed. And sure enough, I was right. I had some people that said, I thought you already were. That's wild. But hey, welcome home, you know. Um, and it's funny to me because that's that is a really good synopsis of my journey, I guess. Um, I started in the evangelical world, like a lot, like you did, like um, a lot of my friends did. I went to a church, you know, I'm, I'm in central Texas here. Um, I jokingly call it a big Texas church. Like that's the denomination <laughs> it was because it was a non-denominational church. Um, and if you are from this area or you have been to this area, you kind of know what I mean. Texas has big everything and churches are no exception. So I grew up going to a fantastic Bible church. Um, it was, I mean, when I look back on my upbringing, I almost feel like there was a bit of a golden year nostalgia to it because, because it was just um, a really great, solid, family-oriented church with a fantastic youth pastor. Um, so I, I could call myself um, having become a Christian around age 13 at uh, youth camp. You know, I was kind of one of those youth camp stories where I remember sitting out on the field at night and kind of realizing, oh, wait, the whole death and resurrection of Jesus actually means something. Like, <laughs> you know, I had gone to Sunday school. I had seen the felt boards. I knew the stories, but I didn't really get um, – how they connected to my own life in, in the 90s, you know, like, what does that have to do with me? So there was something that hit me in um, the summer before my freshman year of high school, where it finally, you know, resonated with me, oh, this matters. And so I would say I became a Christian then. I know we use that language, you know, that's a little bit different. Um, and I've come to think of it slightly differently, but at the time, that's what I said. So became a Christian, even though I had grown up going to a non-denominational church since I was a baby. In fact, my parents were involved in the youth group. They were one of the rare people that really didn't burn out for a long time. You know, like I was in youth ministry for a while and I could stand it for a few years and then I needed to take <laughs> a major break. My parents did it for 25 years. They wow. love uh, teenagers and they love youth. And so I grew up uh, where my parents hosted a Bible study in our house every Wednesday, and it was really popular. Kids from all over um, the city came. I mean, I remember there were like 50 people in our living room one time, and it was just really popular. And all we did was um, open up the Bible and talk about the Sunday sermon. It was kind of one of those, you know, where we're going to unpack what the, the lead pastor said. Um, and then our youth pastor was just a really great Bible teacher. And so I would go to youth group after big church. Did you call it big church? Because I feel like that's evangelical language. I don't know. I, we didn't call it big church. But you didn't uh, call it big church. Okay. No, well, sorry. It, that's okay. It was big church. And then um, we'd go to youth group and it was like a second service. And the Bible teacher or yeah, the youth pastor was so phenomenal as a Bible teacher that I actually learned a lot. I learned a lot of scripture. And so I feel like my teen years were really well formed in the knowledge of scripture. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, and in fact, there's a group of us in the same era, like plus or minus a few years that all became really interested in missions. Uh, our church was also had a really strong missions program and I was involved in that. I started going on mission trips, uh, which is a thing a lot of Protestants do. I guess Catholics do too. <laughs> I'm still learning a lot about, I mean, I've only been a Catholic for a few months, but um, I, I went to Russia in 93, like not too long after the Iron Curtain fell. And that was eye opening for me. I was 15 years old and um, it was such a life changing experience for me that I really became interested in just different cultures or doing some kind of international kind of work long term. I wasn't sure what that would look like. I just felt um, like there was some sort of pull towards 
I don't know, not always staying in the US. Well, long story short, by the time I went to college at the University of Texas, I was thinking I would either become an English teacher or a missionary of some sort. And so that was the path I was on. I wanted to consider being a missionary, perhaps teaching English overseas. And um, so, yeah, I mean, honestly, I can look back and see that my evangelical upbringing was pretty rosy. Um, I was, a, you know, I grew up in the suburbs, middle class, really very few problems. Probably my biggest problem was, you know, algebra getting a B on my tests, that kind of thing. Um, rather charmed, I, I think, looking back. Um, but I went to college, graduated, and decided I really wanted to see if this missions thing was a flash in the pan idea, or this is something actually God had called me to do. So right after I graduated college, I went to Kosovo. This was in 2000, late 90s, 2000, something around there. So if you know your history, that was right when Milosevic um, basically came through the Balkans and in Serbia and uh, Kosovo in particular. And it was an atrocious genocide among the Albanians. And then Clinton sent American troops in, yada, yada. And uh, Americans kind of had an open gate to going into that part of the country as NGOs of some sort. The country effectively stopped being run by a local government and became run by um, outside forces. So uh, K4 is what it was called. It was like Kosovo um, military sort of government run by like the US and Great Britain and Canada and all those things. Anyway, so I went in with an NGO to help teach English. And I say all these things because this was my first experience actually doing something that I felt like God truly was calling me to do and having to step out of my comfort zone. And it was challenging. It was definitely this year where I was away from what I considered just easy life. And, um, yeah, I, I was, uh, I, I had to look square in the face what my faith m actually meant. You know, this is a predominantly Muslim country, and these were amazing people. Like, for the first time, I really felt like I was connecting with people completely different from me, and yet were some of them, I mean, just salt of the earth kind of people. And I had to think about like, what is, what's different about me then? You know, I mean, I claim to know Jesus. I claim to know the um, savior of the world and have the answers yet. Um, and, and not that their lives, I mean, their lives had, were mostly horrific. They had gone through something terrible and yet they seemed to have something I didn't have. And that was fascinating to me. Um, they lived a really slow, um, within the land kind of lifestyle that frankly, I envied, you know, I was stationed in a tiny little village, um, where it was really isolated. I didn't have a vehicle. I had to learn how to cook from scratch. I had a wood burning stove. My electricity went out all the time. Um, I ran out of water all the time. I mean, it was just one of these lives that, um, really, I think God used to, forced my hand into asking what actually mattered. At the same time, this is when I met my husband, Kyle. And so Kyle was there helping to rebuild houses. He was a contractor by trade from Oregon, never been to Oregon, knew nobody from Oregon. And we can put a little X on the dirt road in this tiny little village in the Balkans of where we met. We know exactly where it was. <laughs> and um, so we met, we were just friends, the entire time we were there, but we knew we had kind of some sort of spark. But one of the things that I think really drew us to each other was that we were both interested in missions. And there wasn't this conflict of interest, like where we had to convince the other person, hey, wouldn't this be kind of a good idea? And so long story short, we come back to the US, he goes back to Oregon, I go back to Texas. And we end up getting married less than a year after we come back. So we get married and we start a new life thinking we're going to go overseas 
And we eventually do, but this was our plan, you know, our, our long-term plan. And so we do things a little differently than young married couples. We're not really thinking about um, what does our life look like stateside. We don't register for as many dishes as, as they say you should, that kind of life. <laughs> um, and I say all this to say that during our training, we um, start rubbing shoulders with other types of Christians where we are interacting with people from different um, backgrounds, communities, um, visions and missions for their lives. And in one part of our training, we go to Colorado for a few weeks for um, kind of just a boot camp on how to learn a language while you're on the field. Well, one of the assignments was to go to a church that we are not familiar with and see what we think and just experience kind of a cross-cultural church setting. We end up going to an Anglican church. And you know, now that we're Catholic, I can look back and say, that's not that big a deal. But at the time, it was so scary <laughs> because it, it was ritual and liturgy. And I don't remember if they had incense or not, but, you know, it was in a beautiful building that I I just loved. But um, it dug into my soul like hard and fast. And I remember it was just a regular Sunday service. It wasn't a special day or anything, but I had never been to anything like that. I grew up, um, you know, where our churches were sort of strip mollified, if that makes sense, where yeah. the building was yeah. an afterthought. In fact, I was, I heard all the time growing up churches in a building, it's, it's the people. And so um, that was a time when I was first struck by beauty. I felt like I could see God actually in the walls and in the windows, you know, in, in, in the art. And I just remember thinking, huh, that's remarkable. That's amazing. And it was just such a nondescript Sunday that it almost bothered me that I kept thinking about it afterwards. Like we're talking weeks and months and years later, you know, back when we were just doing our usual thing of support raising and talking to these Sunday school classes and going to missions board meetings and, um, you know, all these places were fine, but they were just, you know, the, the type of Christianity I grew up in. And I just couldn't shake the feeling of that was otherworldly. It almost felt like I was stepping into something that didn't belong here on earth <laughs> and, and I couldn't shake it. So anyway, we end up um, moving to Turkey. That was where we first went. And at this time we had a two-year-old and uh, not too long after that, I became pregnant with number two. And so I was in that stage of, um, and you know what this is like, because you're in this stage too with little <laughs> kids, um, where it was just busy and full and overwhelming and a lot of a lot all the time. <laughs> and it was about three or four months into um, our time in Turkey when I actually one night admitted to Kyle, I'm not doing well. Like, this is not actually what I thought it would be, this new life. Because, you know, we sold just about everything. We didn't have that much to begin with, but we sold just about everything we had and just started completely over. But all new everything. It was like clean slate. And so it was a big commitment. Like, we were basically saying, this is where, what we're going to do the rest of our lives. Yeah. And because this was the trajectory we had been on our entire marriage, it almost felt like I didn't have the permission to do anything else. And so when I finally said, Kyle, this is not something that feels right, um, he took it seriously, and I'm so glad he did. And um, so did our bosses, our team leaders. Um, we let them know I wasn't doing well. They were on the field for many, many years, and so they had had experience with people not doing well. And so they basically said, hit pause. Your family matters. Your um, inner life matters so much more than what you do. Get the help you need. So I end up, you know, from Turkey going to, we end up going for a summer to Thailand because that is where we could get the mental health uh, services I, in English that um, I needed. This, if you know your geography, you know that Thailand is nowhere near Turkey. <laughs> it's another <laughs> 5,000 miles. It's almost like going back to the States, really. Yeah. Um, just in a different direction. And so this wasn't an easy, like, little just puddle jump. Um, this was a big commitment. But what that, and that honestly probably saved my life. But we ended up meeting with a therapist, getting me on meds, you know, getting a formal diagnosis of severe depression. Turns out we could look back and see that I probably um, had postpartum 
with my firstborn and I didn't know it. Um, and so I'm, I'm sharing all these details because it's really, it was really shaking to, for the first time, have this idea of what God expected or wanted from me just being slipped out from under me and almost like this feeling of, um, I don't know, that, that my expectations of what it meant to be a Christian was up for grabs. Like, maybe what I've been believing my whole life isn't true. If so, what is true? And furthermore, who says it's true? You know, so I started asking these questions of why do what I believe, why does what I believe um, hold any weight? Like, where does it come from? Uh, you know, as, as well versed as I was in the Bible, I never really stopped to ask, why is this in the Bible? And who says it's in the Bible? And, um, and what was all of that early church stuff about? Because, um, you know, growing up in the environment I did, I can look back now and it just seems so <laughs> obvious. It's always that way, right? Hindsight. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I knew right up through Acts and Paul's letters. And then it was like, and then nothing happened until about 1600, 1500. <laughs> I mean, I really and truly was had no idea. I And I just assumed that. And I really, I'm floored now that that's how I believe. But at the time, it was really starting to crumble, this idea of like, why do I believe what I believe? Um, thankfully, Kyle was really gracious and and um, did not. This did not scare him at all. My questions, my wonderings, my my feelings of um, doubt. Really, um, there's a term used a lot in the Protestant world these days called deconstructionism. I don't know if you've seen that floating around uh, on the yeah, internet, yeah, yeah. but I, a lot of people seem to be going through that right now. I can look back and say this is this was the start of my deconstruction, um, where it's you know all the bricks start falling because the foundation has a crack in it, and so what you're left with ultimately is a pile of bricks. And the question then is, what are you going to do with those bricks? Are you going to yeah. turn them to dust? Are you going to toss them into a pile and you know or put them in the the scrapyard, or are you going to rebuild? And so um, we end up returning to Turkey. We lived there for several more years, had our second born, ended up having more kids. And uh, we end up moving back to the States for a number of reasons, primarily because of the health of one of our kids. But Kyle and I can both look back and say, I think it was also there was just something that wasn't settling with us. We were there to ch plant churches. Like that was the organization we were with. And we weren't gifted in that regard. You know, we, we were gifted to do the work we were doing in Kosovo, teaching English, rebuilding houses where we were very felt needs hands on people. And yet we mistakenly believed, because this is the world we grew up in, that there is a hierarchy of contributions that one can make as a Christian. And the highest form is to plant a church. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We were not equipped. We were not trained. We were not even really, I mean, I don't want to say we didn't desire it, but we, we just didn't feel like that was something we were specifically called to, yet we did it anyway, because by golly, <laughs> that's what we're called to do. Um, I remember even telling people at the time, if you, you know, instead of asking, are you called to do missions work? Are you called to do church planning? Ask if you're not called to do church planning or not called to do missions, because otherwise you should be. I mean, that's really and truly how dogmatic I was about this idea. Um, and so we just started questioning, like, planting a church? Like, says who? Like, what, what kind of church? Under whose authority? What are we doing here? Who's, who's in charge here? And then if we were to just sort of join a random group of Christians church, like, you know, it, what denomination? And and if we don't completely agree with that doctrine, are we okay with that? Where, where's the line with agreeing to disagree? It just felt like a big tangled mess, you know? And we didn't, it just didn't make sense. So I think that was also a reason we moved back because it just didn't settle in our bones that this was what we were supposed to be doing with our time. It's not that we were just wasting time. It was that this didn't seem to be the way. <laughs> like, this didn't seem to be what Jesus meant when he meant to spread the gospel. 
So, and that's not to disparage the good work being done by Protestant missionaries, not at all. We, we met the most amazing people during our time. Um, but we ended up moving back. We, this time we moved to Oregon to work with an organization. And um, we moved to a small town with very few church options. Turns out, I now know there's a really cool Catholic church, but at the time that was not an option. Um, I kept thinking about that, Angl <clears throat> excuse me, I kept thinking about that Anglican church, the one that we visited in Colorado by this time, several years had passed. It was probably five years and I wanted more of that, but I didn't have that option where we were in Oregon. So we just went back to a Bible church because that's what we knew. And I mean, it's, I hope I'm not sounding snarky. I really and truly don't mean to. Hold on just a minute. <clears throat> I don't mean to sound snarky because I really am grateful for so much of what I've learned through my Protestant background. But um, right away, we didn't feel like this was the right church for us, but we were just tired. So we just went and started going through the motions because um, it's what we do. You know, we are Christians. We go to church. Um, but Kyle and I immediately just felt in our bones that this church was not, I don't know, what we had in mind. It met in the local high school, um, really loud music. It, there was a literal smoke machine. They actually had earplugs <laughs> by the programs when you walked mm -hmm. in in case the music was too loud for you. Um, and... The pastor, God love him. I mean, he was a he was a delightful human. We we knew him, um, but it was just it had a vibe. Like Kyle and I eventually said that it felt like going to a rock concert followed by a TED talk. And that's <laughs> what it felt like to go to church. We never once yeah. had communion there, never once, um, and we were there several years. So it just it didn't seem like actually church. Like we would leave and just think, huh, that was a thing. You know, and this whole time we were just craving something. We were craving mm -hmm. something. I mean, I can look back now and say we were craving something eternal and otherworldly and something we were actually made for. I just didn't know how to say that. Um, you know, I was still on antidepressants, still struggling with that a little bit. But um, at this time with three young kids, this is about when we said um, we do miss living overseas. We do miss the cross-cultural um, side of us. And we miss, honestly, raising our kids cross-culturally. That was something we never got sick of when we lived overseas. We loved the opportunities um, raising our kids in another culture afforded. And so we started saving our pennies to one day backpack around the world, just thinking that would be a really fun idea. Well, um, we just started entering this phase when both of us were working from home and we were homeschooling and our oldest was nine, uh, almost nine. And our youngest was three and a half, like just out of diapers, which was, as you know, it was a game changer. It was like a whole new world, <laughs> changed everything. And so we started thinking, you know, this is a really cool window of time because these are still kids. It's not like they have this, you know, burgeoning social life that we need to work <laughs> around. Um, but they're old enough to hold their own backpacks and they're old enough to feed themselves and go to the bathroom and all those great things. This might be the time to do this thing we're talking about. So we end up uh, traveling around the world for a school year. Um, everyone just had one backpack each and we went westbound. So from the States, we went to China and then 30 countries later, we land back in the States <laughs> and this was partly, I mean, honestly, this was mostly because we wanted to. Um, we worked the whole time. You know, this wasn't a vacation. We had to find Wi-Fi and all these nooks and crannies of the world. I had to keep writing. Kyle was working for another NGO. Um, and so we were doing plenty of work. But I think we can look back and see also that there's a little bit of escapism, but not running away. It was almost running to something. And I, I think... I can see that we were in search of something. Um, <clears throat> weirdly, one of the fringe benefits we felt like was that we had a, a pass to not have to go to church. I mean, that was the honest truth. We felt this like, oh, good. Now we have a real reason to just be in this waiting period that we actually have been in. We were in this in-between stage. Now we can just claim it and say this is what we're in. Kyle and I have now since said, like, can you imagine if we were Catholic? How amazing would that be? <laughs> to go like tour day masses around the world. But at the time we weren't. And so um, 
we saw it as an excuse to not go to church. So this was a season of um, serious outward and inward vagabonding of, of asking God, where in the world are we supposed to be? Um, we were partly asking that geographically, like we were open to living anywhere in the world. We missed cross-culture living, like I said. Um, but I think in really we were also asking where can we find Jesus? Like we know of Jesus, we know him, we love him, but where is he? Yeah. And uh, we came back to the States and started going to an Anglican church. We moved back to Texas and the Anglican church that we joined was immediately, it had that feeling of this is the beauty we were after. This is the, um, the sense of otherworldliness that seems fitting to the God of the universe. And so the liturgy of this Anglican church, the, the, the people, the art, the architecture, the music, the incense, all of it seemed just right. It, it felt like, it wasn't so much like, ah, finally, this is what we've been after because this is what we deserve. It was almost like, oh, finally, this is what God deserves, or this is what Jesus deserves. Um, and I, I know that sounds weird, but it, it seemed to be like, this is what is meant to worship yeah. our maker. And so it just felt so at home. And we also said this is the first time we had felt pastored since like our youth group years. Um, the priest knew our names, our family names. We got to know people again. And it felt like it was a thing that if we did not go to regularly, we would be missing out. So the Anglican church felt like home. And we ended up being involved more or less five years in the Anglican church of North America, that denomination, because it felt like home. Um, we were confirmed in it. And, you know, all this this liturgy and these rites and these sacraments, even though I grew up taking communion once a month, it was always a, um, a symbolic thing, you know, and it was grape juice and a cracker. And it didn't really mean that much. And this time we were, take, we were taking the Eucharist every week. And there's a concept within the Anglican Church called the Via Media, which is the middle way. And whenever I was going through confirmation, this is what really resonated with me. They drew this, it was a um, Y axis, X axis grid, whatever you call that, with a circle. And they drew on um, one, I think the, the Y axis, it was, um, I'm trying to remember if it was like, oh, contemplation. And then on the South was activism. And then on the left, the east side of the x-axis was evangelicalism and on the right side was catholicism and then they drew a big circle in the middle and they said this is where we are we are right in the middle of all of that and to me it was like oh yes this is what <laughs> i'm after a little of everything no. um because at this time my ideas were still that the catholic church um while it knew a thing or two about architecture and beauty you know, I had just come back from seeing all of the cathedrals and all the places and was just floored. Um, it still just had a little bit of theology that made me go, hmm. And I just couldn't reconcile with it. So Anglicanism felt like the right fit. It was the via media. It, it meant I could be Catholic-ish, you know. I could sort of kind of buy into it without having to completely, I don't know, drink the Kool-Aid, I guess, drink the wine. <laughs> um, and, and of course, I'm saying this in hindsight, but I think the whole time I had this weird itch of like, this is fine. This is good. I can also say it felt like I could be Anglican and not rock the boat of my extended family or my upbringing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have to explain, you know, I'm still a Protestant. Yeah. You know, when my parents come to church with us, they think this is a little high church smells and bells, but you know, it's okay. It's fine. They read the Bible a lot. Boy, that's great. Um, and Hey, they're not Catholic. And so, um, it felt safe. It felt like a safe form of Catholicism. Um, but then that pesky question of says who kept coming up. <laughs> um, I love history. I always have. And I just started reading about some 
older Christians, some people that I had long heard of, had always wanted to read and thought, I'm Anglican. I can, I should now read these church fathers I keep hearing about. So I started reading Augustine and a little bit of Irenaeus and um, boy, they really get in the way <laughs> of some of my <laughs> ideas because um, they were asking the questions I was asking and they were flawed human beings that really, really seemed to love Jesus. And they did not seem to be these, um, these I don't want to say boogeymen, but these people that um, just didn't really know any better. And now that, you know, we're post-Reformation and enlightens, we, we, un, we know better. It, it didn't seem like that at all. These seem like real human beings really wrestling with theology and what it meant to love Jesus well. And so I started reading, and it seemed like things were pointing toward the Catholic Church, but it still didn't settle right with me, so I wasn't ready. Um, and so I, I would secretly start, I don't know, reading some books. I started... Um, I don't know, doing some research. I started listening to podcasts like yours, started listening, you know, watching some YouTube channels. I started Google, Google became my friend. I would Google, you know, Catholic, apostolic succession, why not Anglican <laughs> or um, Eucharist, meaning, you know, all those things. Um, I knew I would have to one day ask a question of Mary but I wasn't ready for that yet. That was going to be my like grand finale of like, if I can buy all this other stuff, then maybe I'll get to the Mary <laughs> stuff. Otherwise that's just so out there. I'm not quite ready to, to dive into that. But um, anyway, I spent quite a few years going to my Anglican parish and then doing a lot of research at home um, in my spare time of like, why, why are we Anglican? Why did the Anglican church form? What does it mean? Um, to be Anglican versus something else. And then um, this little pandemic happened. <laughs> this, <laughs> this thing you might have heard of. Yeah. And, yeah. and suddenly we couldn't go to our parish. Suddenly it was going to be live streamed. Weirdly, looking back, it, it was weird to me, but I kind of felt a bit of relief because I felt a little like, <gasps> Maybe this is an opportunity where I can really ask these questions without feeling this like, you know, two sides of my heart that felt like they were kind of saying the same thing, but I was felt like I was being one thing in public and another thing in private. And so I just asked Kyle one day, I said, so I've been doing a bit of research about the Catholic Church, and I know you've been just dissatisfied with church for a while and this whole thing. Do you want to maybe use this pandemic to kind of, I don't know, do some research with me? He was like, yep, let's do it. Let's do that. Um, that this sounds like a good time for that. So we, you know, late March of 2020 started deep diving into all the things. We made all the Google Docs, all the spreadsheets, all the links, all the places. <laughs> and this became our research project wow. together. And asked these questions. And then, I mean, hours and hours of getting these, you know, resources, trying to get to the original sources of church fathers and, um, and saints and just, you know, the, the cloud of witnesses that went before us and finding these answers that had been there the whole time. And I just, I don't know, I didn't, I either just didn't see it or I didn't literally know about it. I would hear of these names and they just sounded like historic um, bookmarks, you know, like I had heard of St. Catherine of Siena. I went to her cathedral. I actually saw her body. Um, and yet it, she just still felt like this like statue in a museum. But then when I started actually reading their words and finding out the amazing things they did, the saints I think really were the ones that ushered me into a realization of what I actually belonged to and what I was looking for. Um, I was looking for the sacraments and I was looking for the saints. I was looking for my brothers and sisters, my family that I was longing for. And I was looking for Jesus through an in an embodied form. 
Like I was, and, and the Eucharist, yes, but also in, you know, reconciliation, in confirmation, in um, even just the liturgy, the practice of crossing myself, of um, bowing, of standing and kneeling and sitting, you know, doing doing all the things. I, I was looking for something embodied because I am a human being. I am not just a brain floating around. I, I, it seemed to match the thing that my body and soul were searching for. And so um, we started looking into RCIA in our local parish and it was fine, but I don't know, RCIA, <laughs> Well, okay. I know that some people have great experiences. Ours wasn't super great, but it's not because these lovely men and women didn't care. I know they did. It just wasn't, we weren't the target demographic for yeah, it. Yeah. Um, they were asking really good questions, but questions that we didn't have is maybe the thing. And so we would go to our RCIA meeting and we would leave saying like, you know, we're really on board with, yes, there is a God, but we want to know what the heck are indulgences. <laughs> and I don't know if we're going to get to that if like we're into week four or five of RCIA and we're still talking about the existence of God. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure this is going to go in the direction we hope. So um, I honestly don't even remember how this happened, but um you know, one, one of the bright spots of all this was Twitter, Catholic Twitter, yeah. um, became a place where I could lurk and learn from a lot of people and um, see kind of living saints that I wanted to be part of. And I just started following different people here and there. And I ended up connecting with Andrew Pettiprin, who, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I guess at the show. Yeah, and he's in my neck of the woods just a few hours away, and he had a similar story. He he became Catholic after being Anglican, and it wasn't that long ago. It was like the year before, and here he is being super Catholic online publicly, and heck, <laughs> he even works for this amazing Catholic apostolate, and um, I wonder if he would be a resource. And so we ended up following each other and I just sent him a little DM and just kind of said, Hey, and told him a little bit of our story. And he, I mean, God bless him. He immediately connected us where we needed to go. He said, have you ever considered the ordinariate? And I said, what is the ordinariate? <laughs> because there's so <laughs> much um, Catholic ease that I was not aware of that I felt like every day I was learning a new word, a new concept. Um, and so I was like, I don't know what that is. Well, he said that actually makes sense. A lot of Catholics don't even know what this is. <laughs> but the ordinariate is a diocese set up, you know, most dioceses are set up geographically. Well, this one is not quite set up geographically. This is the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. And what this is, is um, Pope Benedict set this up, I believe it was 2009. Um, in response to so many Anglicans wanting to enter into full communion with the Catholic Church. And because so much of the theology and the liturgy was the same, that there was very little need to do a full-on RCIA type of situation, that he actually, I, I mean, honestly, he he created this ordinary, he gave the blessing of this ordinary so that churches could transition from being Anglican to Catholic in mass, like entire parishes. Um, there's only three ordinary, uh, I, what do you call them? Like headquarters? <laughs> I can't think of the word. Um, in the world. One's in Australia, one's yeah. in the UK, and one is in Houston, Texas, which is like two hours away yeah. from me. And it's like, what are the odds? And um, so he just told me, you know, that's so close to you guys. You might want to consider maybe joining the church through that. And so um, he put us in touch with one of his old friends who was also an Anglican priest turned Catholic priest. Um, married with kids, fantastic guy, also a podcaster. Um, I, you know, we started just getting to know each other online as well. And basically he started meeting with us over Zoom. So we had Zoom RCIA <laughs> and, um, and it was exactly what we needed. We started meeting with him once a week and we, all we did was we read through the catechism and it felt like, oh, this is what we need to be doing. So Kyle and I started reading the catechism, like just going directly to the source. And we would read a certain chunk of it and bookmark any questions we had. And then we would meet um, at the end of the week with him over Zoom and he'd say, all right, what questions do you have? And it was like, this is what 
this is exactly the path we need to be on. Um, we used to call it, this was the Disney fast pass of becoming Catholic because <laughs> we could um, bypass RCIA, but it wasn't really that. It was more the idea of um, staying on the path that God was pointing us to because um, we couldn't not. You know, I know I hear people say this a lot, but um, there became a point where we were moving toward conversion because it would be disobedient not to. Because we once you know things, you can't unknow things when it comes to the history or um, the meaning behind Catholic theology that um, you had been told was one thing, but turns out was quite another. Um, once you start learning those things, um, one of my biggest hangups before fully converting was my, one of my friends who was Baptist and then became Catholic. Um, I would, she was my kind of safe space to ask a lot of questions. I really did not understand the idea of closed communion. I by this time I was really longing to maybe go to a weekday mass and just to experience it a little off to the side. But I was terrified to go because I knew I couldn't partake in the Eucharist. Yeah. And there was something about that that felt um, off-putting to me, uh, more than off-putting, perhaps. It almost felt like this isn't what Jesus meant. I mean, I think I even said that to her. I was like, I'm not sure this is what Jesus meant. Let some people partake in the Eucharist, but not others. Um, and you just have to agree with these little things, sign on the dotted line, and then you're part of the club. That's how it sounded to me. And in fact, there was um, a point where I thought, well, gosh, I can't become Catholic then. Because if you require all these, um, all this correct theology in order for me to partake in the Eucharist, then I don't want to be part of that, is how I felt. It also felt a little bit um, hypocritical because I would see some Catholics get to partake who were cradle Catholics who didn't really seem to know their stuff that much more than I did. In fact, sometimes I felt like I knew more about Catholicism than they did, and yet they got to go up and partake. And that's how it felt at the time. Yeah. So whenever we fully decided, okay, this is the path we're coming into, it really became an act of submission. It did not become this act of, we completely understand everything now. We get, all our questions have been answered. We understand fully um, these things, but you know, our Father Jonathan, the the priest who confirmed us, put it this way. He said, you know, sometimes it's finding that one domino that you just need knocking down to knock down so that all the other ones knock down. And for me, it became um, the apostolic succession, like the papacy, because if that's truly what Jesus meant when he established the church, then all these other things, not so much I'll figure out, but I can submit to and I can spend the rest of my life asking these questions. Not a day goes by still that I'm not like Googling something. <laughs> like I say, I'm Catholic now. What does it mean to, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so for me, that became the domino, this idea that, okay, you know, this is the the original church that Christ founded. It. I used to think of it as like a tree with just lots of different branches. And the Catholic church was one of those branches, just like the Baptists and the Presbyterian and the Anglican. But um, reading scripture through the lens that I was given from the catechism and from the church fathers made me see that, oh, uh, the Catholic church is the trunk. And th this is the church, actually. It's not a denomination. <laughs> and that changed everything for me because, I don't know, I just realized I can figure everything else out, but... Um, I need to obey really and truly what it came down to. And so then came the process of telling friends and family, and that was not easy. But um, right now, even we're still in the process of like, how do we communicate this to the people that love us, but think we are crazy. <laughs> and this makes no sense because most people we know in our life here in central Texas are Protestant. You know, mm -hmm. the kids, our kids go to school with our, our dearest friends, um, they're all Protestant. Our parents are both very, um, very much not Catholic <laughs> and think this is a little nuts. But um, we're grateful that most everybody still loves us and and know that we love Jesus. And um, 
I know you know Keith Nestor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of his stuff has been really helpful for us too. And one of the things he said in his book that was really great for us is when it's your first year of being a Catholic, your your best maneuver is just to be an even better Christian. Like yeah. be a really good Christian. Really just um, rest in Christ's grace and mercy and love you know, partake in the Eucharist often, partake in reconciliation often, and um, sit in that. Don't feel like you need to be a keyboard warrior. Um, Don't feel like you need to now have this great thesis statement of why you believe what you believe. And so that's where I'm at today. I'm always formulating these things. I'm wanting to, I don't know, figure out the right answer to give to my Protestant brothers and sisters who don't get what we're doing. But I mean, I'm at where I'm at. I'm still a baby Catholic, but I'm very, very grateful. I mean, every week, even though there's a lot of things that I miss about being Anglican, to be honest, um, I'm still grateful to be where we're at now. So, yeah. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Well, and Keith Nestor's not a, he's, he's a smart guy. He knows mm-hmm. a few things. I'm glad. Yeah. He's a, <laughs> That's great. Wow. I think you have the record now for the longest, uh, the longest. Dang, really? Fully, I think you beat Jimmy Aiken. Yeah, for his story. Serious? Oh my gosh. Yeah, because yeah, you so. do let guests go for a long time. And I thought, surely I'm not going to go as long as everybody else. <laughs> I think you have the record now. So Jimmy, really? get, out of the, get out of the way. <gasps> you're, <laughs> like a, you're like the Catholic Oprah. You're like a good listener and people just start opening up. That's, that's really high praise. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're really inflating my ego with this episode. So thank you. That's great. My wife's going to love this. I, I think back to one of the first things you said, which resonates with me entirely. And this, I think, kind of feeds into the rest of your journey. The idea that you, like me, read the, the Bible voraciously a lot, but it, it ended with the last book of the Bible. Right, and then there's this giant kind of g- gap in history, and how ludicrous that <laughs> that is, right? In reality, but somehow, so many of us live that way, right? I mean, I, a good friend of mine now, Dr. Doug Beaumont, who was on this show, yes, and he taught he taught at, a, at an evangelical seminary, one of the one of the best in the states at the time. You know, he 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 sought out, he changed his whole life, up and his whole family's life to, to get there and, and be there, and then teach there. He kind of came to the realization at some point that wait a minute, where, where did all this history go? Yeah, right. Because you're you're steeped in this world that that takes the Bible so seriously, but the Bible just kind of is there, and then we're living here in in 2020 or whatever, 2021, wherever we're living, and there's nothing in between. And how kind of crazy that is, right? right. Right. You know, it's funny you mentioned him. He his book was also formative in our journey. Yeah. I read his um what Evangelical Exodus. Yes. And it was so helpful because here are these amazing, brilliant Protestant thinkers, scholars who took their faith so seriously. And in fact, I think one reason he was so helpful is because he actually said, I didn't want to become Catholic. Yeah. Like he was fighting <laughs> it. And he said when he finally did, it was like he was swimming the Tiber, almost like against his will. He was just going with the tide. And that's very much how it felt like we were going to, it, it wasn't like suddenly joining something amazing after leaving something terrible. We had an amazing church. Yeah, yeah. We loved the people. And so it was hard to go. But yeah, I just couldn't reconcile everything I was seeing from early church documents and and writings. And yeah, I mean, it's it's very funny how now I can look back and see like, yeah, Book of Revelation. It doesn't just stop there and then show up again with a Martin Luther's, you know, 95 Theses. There's a yeah, lot of yeah. stuff in between. Yeah, because the question for me was, I mean, and I, and I can trace this back too to, for me, early, early mid high school when I was in a, an amazing youth group and the issue of Calvinism came up. And suddenly people in this youth group were, I mean, we were, we were pretty, we were pretty uh, uh, voracious theologians or, or whatever at this time in high school. So somebody read Calvin and then suddenly this idea of the elect came and predestination came up and our, our pastor had to come in and kind of quell the fire that was, that was burning in the youth group. But, but back then it occurred to me, wait a minute, how come we can't read the same Bible and come to the same conclusion? Why are we fighting over what the Bible means and how are we, how are some right and some wrong and how do we know who's right and who's wrong? And, and I mean, that was a seed for me that then came up later on in, in university when, when, of course, I began to wrestle with the idea of tradition and what happened in those intervening years and where did the Bible come from? And these questions that, I mean, it's, it's funny that we, you can live as a Christian without asking these questions, but, but you can, right? And then 
when you begin to ask those things, I feel like that really begins to kind of unseat you and makes you feel uncomfortable. We, we too, my wife and I both converts left our a church that we loved dearly. We were involved in every part of that church pretty much. Had been married in that church. All of our friends were in that church. We were beginning to raise our kids in that church, and suddenly. Right, I, I tell my story of being uh, my Canadian conversion story of cooling a pot of soup in the snow out back behind the house because I had to put it in the blender. I wanted it to cool it down first. So I put it in the snowbank, and I so there are my slippers. And I thought, you know, I read too much. Like I've mm-hmm. I, I've read too much of the early church. To me, it looks like these guys passed on their authority, and those guys passed on their authority, and that that kept on going. And unless I'm willing to say that, yeah, God took that authority away from these guys and said, no, 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 here Luther and Calvin can have it, then I can't. I got to be Catholic, and I, and I couldn't find a compelling reason. I read tons of, probably like you, tons of books trying to figure out when that authority got passed over to Calvin and Luther, and I couldn't, fig- I couldn't trace that out, right? I, yeah. I couldn't figure that out. I remember even meeting with my Anglican priests, like, yeah. can you help me understand the Anglican perspective of apostolic succession? And they actually, you know, they said, oh, yeah, we can look back to Thomas Cramner in the 1500s, blah, 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 Henry VIII, but I was like, but okay, <laughs> so what you're telling me is there's a big jump, but then the apostolic succession continues. Oh, yeah, like I can look back and see, you know, that this bishop laid hands on me and then his and his and his. And I thought, well, that's great, but at some point the branch was severed, right? I mean, like that's literally how it happened. Henry VIII took his ball and played elsewhere. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, so we just followed that line of apostolic succession, and it just didn't settle with me as much as I hated it. It's like what um, John Henry Newman says, you know, to be yeah. steeped in history is to cease to be a Protestant. Um, that's That was so true for me. I couldn't not, like you. Yeah, yeah cause, I mean, I, I stopped over in Anglicanism briefly, looking into uh, definitely intellectually trying to consider that as a, you know, as the middle way. Mm-hmm. But that the, it, it was for me just kind of passing the buck, though, right? Because I, I thought, well, then, like you said, yeah, okay, so now there's this other church structure versus my non-denominational church structure, but where does the authority come from there? And again, yeah. I ran into that issue of, well, it seems to have broken off from here at this point, right? And if we're willing mm-hmm. to say that that the Catholic Church was wrong and, and we're going to fix that, or they they strayed and we're going to kind of continue the, the lineage of what the, the apostles created, well, I, I feel like there's got to be a compelling argument or, or place you can point to to say that. Right, yeah. and I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I mean, my, my good friend Rod Bennett, who writes on the early church, some fabulous uh, uh, narrative stories from the early church. He often says, like, I mean, his his challenge that really challenged me, and I've I've since tried to repeat this. I think it's really worth repeating. Is if you took those very first Christians that wrote after the apostles that heard the apostles, right? Like just you know someone like Irenaeus or Ignatius or Polycarp or just a martyr who was there early on and learn from some of these early apostles and disciples, and and plunk them down right now in 2021, where would they feel most comfortable, right? Mm-hmm. And and his argument was, and I think this is valid, they look for the authority. They look for that, that authority structure that, that carries on right back to Christ. Whether mm-hmm. or not, whether or not, I mean, we accepted that as evangelicals yeah. or as, uh, or, you know, as an Anglican, it, it has subsided since the beginning and it continues to go on whether or not we see it or not whether we see it as a, as a branch or that is the trunk right it's it's so interesting i think yeah. so <laughs> stopping and thinking about that yeah i mean is is terribly challenging you know what's funny is that my priest actually said the same thing my anglican priest he said if some of these church fathers were to come you know be in the present day where would they feel most comfortable as i think what he said he said probably the anglican church because there is still the structure and the liturgy but without all the extras that the catholic church have added on and so he had this perspective that um the middle way was the true like you know the ground that we needed to be walking on because you know it's that idea of barnacles you know yeah, that there's barnacles. the ship and all all the barnacles and and the anglican church has it right because they've they've scraped off all the barnacles but um that just didn't settle with me at all it didn't seem to make sense like you know it ultimately comes down to the question says who you know yeah. where does this come from um i read a really great book too it's um an immovable feast he is a former anglican as well turned catholic and he had the, the same experience um along with this idea of beauty, you know, and, and the via pulchritudinis, which I, I think was also a huge 
um, pull for me because it seemed like beauty was the way that God had really captured my imagination with the liturgy. And that's what I grew to love so much about the Anglican uh, way. But where it just seemed to be stuck is it almost felt like it was, I mean, I know this, this is never what my Anglican brothers or sisters would say. It just felt like it was beauty for beauty's sake. It was almost like the robes and the incense and the, and the crossing yourself was ritual for the sake of tradition without it being like, without the foundation really. Um, and I love the idea of how ultimately how God led me to the church was from the transcendental um, idea of beauty, but then it led to goodness, which then led to truth because I loved the Catholic social teaching. I loved that the Catholic church got in your business about how to live your life. You know, like they felt like they had a say in your family, you know, your domestic monastery and, and how you um, thought of your vocation. Um, that I, I loved that because it wasn't just, you know, taking the Eucharist on Sundays. And so the goodness of the church seemed to follow the beauty. And then ultimately I could ask the question says who, and I could point to says who, you know, these, these people that, that Jesus commissioned and, you know, through all their faults, through all the messiness of the church seems to still be going on. I mean, it doesn't make sense that the Catholic church would still be around otherwise. It's a hot mess, you know? Um, and yet here it is, you know, 2000 plus years later, um, this institution divinely appointed by Christ. Yeah, and it seems like sometimes it just seems so terribly wrong. There's, there's things going on that are that are a mess, and you're like, oh, why is why is this bishop saying this and this happening here? I, I love what you said about this idea of submission, right? I have heard that so often on this program, and of course, I I experience that myself, and I I wrestle every single time with how to articulate that the best way for evangelical ears because it does, it seems so crazy, right? The idea that you're yeah. submitting to something. I mean, the way. The funny thing about how we would choose churches, and you've you've chosen churches in your past, uh, is we look for a church that we felt like fit for us, that maybe understood the Bible, we'd say the best way, and had kind of worship music that we kind of liked, and stuff for family and uh, families and that kind of thing. It, it we we chose churches, mm -hmm. right? And it, but it, so that's the idea. So that's kind of how you do that as even joke, but it's, it's so different. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just so, so different. The idea of becoming Catholic out of that, you don't just go and choose the Catholic church and go, yeah, I agree with all these things. That sounds good. I'll become Catholic. It's, it's so different. And submission is the right word, yeah. but how to make that make sense for somebody who's like submission? Like, what do you mean? I, 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 you know, I moved to a new town and I choose a church and I go there. I, I'm choosing that thing. Right. But it's, it's so different. When I, when I first announced that we were Catholic, I had a few letters from readers um, from, you know, that sent me emails that felt a little confused that we had become Catholic because what it felt like to them is what we were saying is we, um, we agreed with all this theology and that's why we were joining. Like, we agreed that this is what it meant about these sorts of people and what we felt, you know, what our opinion was on this particular doctrine. And... Um, you know, I, I totally understand where they're coming from because that's how I felt. But really and truly, that's a Protestant way of looking at it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, does this line up with my beliefs? Instead of asking, says who about my, you know, what it is that I believe and what we're ultimately saying when we decide, you know, I'm going to go to this, I'm going to look around for a new church because I just don't agree with their theology of fill in the blank, or even I don't like the style of music or whatever it is, what we're saying is I want to be my own Pope. You know, I want to be the one to decide. And really when it comes to being Catholic, what you're saying is I'm not my own Pope. And that yeah. to me is what submission is. And in fact, the night we, we came into the church, you know, this was in Houston. So we stayed the night in a hotel. I remember Kyle and I just fell asleep and we, we were just jokingly saying in bed, we don't have to be our own Pope anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and I think that's, that really hints at the idea of submission because we recognize it's not about us. It's yeah. not about what we think. This is why we have 35,000 denominations because human beings have been asking, 
what about me? What do I think? And if it doesn't make sense to me, then I'm going to start something new. And yeah, submitting means saying, I don't, you know, I, I reject that idea. I reject that I know what I'm talking about more than 2000 years of, um, of saints and, um, and those who maybe know what they're talking about, even if it doesn't make sense to me, you know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I go back to what we said earlier about the idea of, of missing that whole history between the Bible and, and present. Like, we, it's not as if either of us or any of us who are evangelicals who became Catholic thought, like, oh, I'm so smart, I, I can be my own pope and know what all this means and reject all this these years of teaching. We didn't know it existed in many yeah. cases, right? Like, the, the normative way of being a Christian was to read your Bible, in, interpret it in that church community or with the theologians that you liked from your from your library or, or what based on what the pastor and uh, the pulpit said, and, and then live that life. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we didn't even know that we were doing it uh, That's right. in, in a way that was novel, that was really invented at the Reformation, right? Yeah. Which is kind of crazy to think about. And, and then also so very much American in a sense too, right? The idea mm -hmm. that I, I can, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in Canada, but it's a, a similar uh, yeah. thought, right? right. That, I, that I know what I'm doing, I can do this for myself or in my small community, and we've got it figured out, versus opening your eyes and realizing that there is that, that 2000 years of history mm -hmm. that has, has been there since the beginning and people interpreting this before you and, and, and maybe a church that has passed on the authority to actually say what's what. I mean, that's pretty, that's eye-opening, but so yeah. radically different from how yeah. we used to do it, right? And, and with no awareness that that even existed in many cases, this idea. Right. I mean, to be Catholic is is really not a very American thing to do. And I don't just mean like demographics, you know, the amount of Catholics here. I mean, you know, to be American is, is to be independent, is to be autonomous. It's to decide you know, that you're going to be a self-made person. And to be a Catholic, you're saying no to all those things. You're saying yeah. that's actually not how life works. And so it feels really countercultural in that way. And um, yeah, I don't know. It feels what you, when you said that, I was reminded of this idea. Um, I think it was actually Keith Nestor when he was talking, when he was like um, Protestant, big, becoming Catholic. Big, and big head here in the show. I know. Yeah. And um in his process, um, some people would ask him, like, what are you pro Protestants protesting anyway? <laughs> and he would just say, like, nothing. We're not yeah. protesting anything. And I felt that way. It was like, yes, that's exactly right. And so sometimes I think cradle Catholics don't quite understand that. They think Protestants are walking around being... I've decided not to become Catholic for reasons X, Y, and Z. And it wasn't, it was, I didn't even think about it. It, yeah. it wasn't an option. So it, it just didn't cross my mind that I would want to become Catholic for quite a while. Yeah. I, I can remember reading, we were on a vacation in Costa Rica. It was so lovely before we had kids. Wife was actually pregnant with our first and we decided to do a little baby moon. And I brought a pile of books with me that got wet in, in the pool and got totally wrecked. But <laughs> I was reading St. Francis de Sales, his Catholic controversy. And mm. he was Bishop of Geneva during the Reformation, um, living in exile, I think for most of it, and sneaking back into the city and slipping pamphlets under the doors of these different Protestant who were becoming Protestant under Calvin and some of the reformers there. And I remember encountering one of his, his pamphlets that was part of this collection. They kind of said, like, well, who whose authority are you are you planning that church with? Like under under whom are you deciding to start this new break off church? Like who's your bishop? Who's your mm -hmm. who's and I thought, that's a weird question. But then I thought, <laughs> yeah, you know what? That that uh, it's a valid question. Because at some point somebody decided that the Catholic Church was wrong and I'm gonna start a new church here under my own um, hubris, my own ego, mm -hmm. my own personality, my own charisma, start this thing over here. And that was a novel, that was a brand new thing that happened, right? And, to, and then to read the Bible based on how this guy read the Bible, right? And Calvin mm -hmm. was famous for saying, I have the right interpretation and you're all kind of wrong, right? right? Which is kind of funny to think that then what came from that was, was all these different denominations. Mm -hmm. But at, at some point that wasn't normative, but you know, we, we becoming evangelical, that for us, we're, we're raised in that water. That's the air we breathe, right? But at mm -hmm. some point, that was a new thing. And so, I mean, for me and for you, it, it's a historical question in a sense of, well, then it, what are the roots of, of my faith? Because that looks like that's a new thing that kind of started over here. Yeah. Does this go deeper than that? I mean, the, the Anglican Church is similar, right? This thing, thing kind of started over here. Is there something deeper beyond mm -hmm. that? And then that becomes yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it felt like, you know, the, my perspective of the Catholic Church for many years growing up was just, it, these are Christians that really like a lot of a lot of extras. You know, they like, they must just like this hierarchy. They enjoy a lot of structure. They like all these robes and, and these formulas. And it, and, you know, it didn't really resonate with me that perhaps this was how it was supposed to be. And that, you know, the, the Judaic, the Jewish tradition that, that Christianity actually comes from was full of ritual as well and full of this hierarchy and full of structure. And, you know, so when I grew up, you know, in a Bible church, if the question was posed under what authority, like says who, it would always be the Bible. Well, yeah. whatever the Bible says. And so when you look at that and you see the, these words from um, the apostles, you don't see, all, you know, the, the Catholic church rituals. Now you see, poor Jewish peasants. And it just, there was a disconnect until you start understanding the Jewish roots yeah. of our faith and realizing like, actually <laughs> the way the Catholic way, you know, the church um, is pretty darn similar to how it must've been and how it resonated with that Jewish culture. Yeah. And yeah. that is a fascinating exercise too. I've had, uh, John Bergs was one of my favorite guests on the show. <laughs> yes. He's such a treat. He's the nicest guy in the world. I always say this. He's such a okay. nice guy. He's done some fantastic work on that, right? And you, you, yep. you begin to uncover this idea that, okay, so either if we're saying that we're, we're Protestant, then there's a huge giant break from the Jewish tradition. And it seems kind of like a really awkward, strange, like cleaving apart of these things. Or if we say that we're Catholic and read the scriptures through that kind of the, the Jewish lens, well, we see this very organic continuity, this fulfillment of the, of, of the Jewish faith, right? And this kind of carries on in, in the priesthood, in the sacraments, in this tangible physical faith. And it kind of makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I'm so grateful for my Bible church upbringing yeah. Um, yeah. because of all the scripture that I learned. But yeah, it's, it, it was very cerebral, you know, very much in our head. And I think that's why um, the the walking into the Anglican church that for that first time, it really connected with me because it, um, it brought my physical, um, it, it helped me connect my brain and my, um, the side that wanted to know the right answers with the side that wanted to fully participate in the, in the life of Christ. And it's funny you bring up John Bergsman because his book was also instrumental for me, Stunned by Scripture, because that's really yeah. what I wanted to ask, you know, ultimately, um, where is this in the Bible? And his work was so instrumental because, you know, I think there's just something about hearing from a convert, you know, that they get the same questions, just knowing, okay, this really smart guy was a convert as well. Um, and he knows his stuff. And so that really resonated with me also. Yeah, that's what I did. I, I literally Googled like Catholic or Protestant converts to Catholicism and thinking that I get nothing on Google. Mm -hmm. And then I found a list and I thought, what, this is a thing that people, people do this? And I was kind of shocked yeah. that yeah. it actually was a thing people did that were smart people, right? And I, th that's what gets me every time are these people who, like you mentioned Doug Beaumont in his book, Evangelical Exodus, these people who dedicated their lives to studying these things and were really smart and really dedicated evangelicals studying the Bible as hard as they could and coming to Catholic conclusions. It's like, wow, okay, so mm -hmm. this, this is a thing. It is a thing. Yeah. I remember thinking the same thing at first. I was like, oh, I thought Catholics would convert to yeah. Protestantism. I thought that yeah. was the thing. Like, they were the ones that finally understood um, the error of their ways and became evangelical or whatever. It really, you know, it was a shock to me that really smart people, Thomas Howard, um, yeah. you know, because I loved his, his sister, Elizabeth Elliot as a missionary. It's like, what him too? There's so many great smart thinkers, Peter Kraft. I read him in high school <laughs> and I thought, boy, this is a smart guy. Too bad he's Catholic. I mean, I really did think that. <laughs> like, no. I would recommend him, except, but man, he was instrumental in my conversion as well. There's so many great people who have paved this, you know, they came through with the machetes and cleared a lot of the yeah. weeds out of the way to where, and I mean, to be 
a convert in this era where I can just at my fingertips ask my questions and find an answer. Yeah. I'm very grateful in that regard. Um, that's one of the the upsides of the internet and social media is like, you know, when it works, it's it's um, a very good instrument to to bring people into the truth. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, I want to ask you one more question. I, I can't yeah. keep you here forever, although I'd, I certainly like to. I, I know that you were Anglican bef before becoming Catholic and bef and after being evangelical, but I'm thinking of those people who or maybe are are evangelical looking for that the the sacramental kind of life i mean i think of myself i i wouldn't know what a sacrament even was as evangelical because we didn't have that that language right we went to church we sang some worship songs we heard from the pastor once a month had communion it was very much a, a, a symbol and our friends had said you know, asked me once, well, what do you, what appeals to you with the sacraments of becoming Catholic? And I thought, what's the sacrament? Like I was, I had no idea, even very close to becoming, prior to becoming Catholic, I didn't know what sacrament was. That wasn't an appeal for me. Now as a Catholic, I couldn't live without these sacraments. Like they're, they're such the lifeblood of, of, of our lives as a family and, and in our church lives. I wonder what you'd say to somebody who is, who is an evangelical, uh, looking at the Catholic church kind of going, well, what are these sacraments and why? Why would I want to do things to live my faith out rather than just read the Bible and, and go to church? Like, mm -hmm. that, I ask the same questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why does it matter, right? Um, you know, I, I had heard when when we were going through Anglican confirmation, the definition of a sacrament, right, is a uh, outward sign of an inward grace or a visible sign of invisible grace. I've he I heard all those and thought, okay, that's great. Why do we need the visible signs though? Like you know, great idea, but are we just doing ritual for the sake of ritual? In which case, like, take it or leave it. If it, if you enjoy liturgy, then great. But if you don't, um, go do something else, right? Yeah. And I think where the dots connect for me is, um, it is kind of what we're getting at when it comes to being living in a very Gnostic world. You know, Gnosticism has been around since the time of Christ, um, and it's this idea of the physical stuff, the 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 non spiritual, um, is not as good as the spiritual or the inward or the things we can't see. Um, that there's a disconnect, and even if we would never ever say that we would be gnostic, um, I think I can look and see that so much of my upbringing had that flavor of it. You know, and it's funny because we would study what. The heresy of Gnosticism was. But, you know, when when we live our lives in the present as though our daily choices don't matter or our physical bodies don't matter, you know, I, I even remember hearing everything's going to burn one day, so why does it matter, you know? <laughs> or um, what is it I heard a lot? Like, the only things that will last are the Word of God and the souls of people. And so those are the only two things that matter. Don't worry about anything else then it really does, I mean, why not ask, like, why wouldn't I just eat pizza every day and not care about taking care of my body? Why does Paul say that they're temples? Why does it matter? You know, um, basically, why does the here and now matter? Why are we here on earth? Why aren't we just ethereal beings? <laughs> and the reason is because that's how God made it. <laughs> you know, God saw it fit and good that we be humans with physical bodies who need to eat to stay alive and who digest and who have itches to scratch and, <laughs> and um, you know, wind to feel and, and grass to feel under our feet. Like we are physical beings. That's how God made us. We can't separate ourselves from that. And so it kind of makes sense to me, at least when it comes to the via pulchritudinus, that God would also see it fit to draw us close to him in a physical way because we are physical beings. And so, you know, when you read John 6 and Jesus talks about eating his flesh and the disciples are saying, that's crazy. You mean metaphorically, right? Or, you know, I mean, that's the modern translation. And he actually doubles down, you know, he says, gnaw and chew like a dog, you know, the same kind of words that were used then. He doesn't just mean, I just meant symbolically. I just meant you know, metaphorically think of me and remember my death and resurrection. That's going to happen pretty soon. No, he meant physically. Um, 
And so when we look at even the world Jesus was in and how physical it was, I don't think we're meant to, to just live in our heads. And that becomes harder and harder for us to grasp in our um, hyper-connected world, you know, in our digitized world. I mean, heck, in COVID tide, right? When we are going to church through a screen, it starts becoming, um, it starts making sense that like, gosh, why do we need to go anywhere? We we can listen to a good sermon here at home. Why does it matter? You have to start asking the question, like, what are we here for? Like, why are we human beings? Why why do we need to grow food and dirt? Why why do do the things that we touch and feel and see matter? And that's that's what it comes down to. We we are sacramental beings. These sacraments um, matter because we live in a sacramental world. Yeah, I, I can think of, uh, during during COVID when the churches were closed. There's Catholic churches in our area were the first to open up again. Once restrictions were kind of lifted and. A lot of our friends who are still evangelicals, their churches were were months and months later opening because they just did things virtual and kind of said, "Why do you guys want a church? Like, what? Is, why? Like, why don't just do it online? Why? Why take the risk and go in, in person?" And it was hard to explain as a Catholic to somebody who doesn't live the sacramental life why that was important, right? To go there and to receive Jesus in the Eucharist and to and to be there and to receive those sacraments. It's it's really a different kind of way of doing life, but it, it's, it's organic. Like it's, mm -hmm. you, you realize that you're, you're built to live that way yeah. in a, in, in a sense. Right. And you, then you of course trace that out in scripture and see these verses you never saw before that make it quite plain and obvious sometimes mm -hmm. when your eyes are open to that, that, that yeah, that kind of makes sense that the, these things are, are the way it is, these physical yeah. touchstones. Right, right. And it really comes full circle back to the topic of submission and obedience, right? Yeah. Even if it seems like a really strange way that God would have set it up so that we actually literally eat the flesh of Christ and yeah. that you are going to ordain these these people to to make this happen 2,000 plus years later. It doesn't make any sense. It's true. <laughs> and so it is a, an act of submission to say this is what it seems to be. And yeah, so ultimately how I feel now is I want to be where Jesus is. And mm -hmm. I know that sounds really trite, but if that's really and truly how Jesus set it up, you know, and that he can be found in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. through the Eucharist, then I got to be there, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad you spent your COVID time doing this deep dive research because now we are all benefiting from from <laughs> your story. So Me that's too. Fantastic. Me too. I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a lot of fun for me. I think really informative for listeners. I think they're going to love this episode. So I want to thank you for being here. Where can they go uh, to find out more from you if they haven't already, don't already follow you? I don't know who, who this is, who hasn't heard of you or isn't already following you, but there might be a couple people out there. Where can they go to, to follow you and find more stuff? Where do you want to point them towards? The easiest way is honestly just tishoxenwriter.com because I've got everything linked there. I do a podcast called The Drink with a Friend, and I have a newsletter that's really fun, and it's just all linked there. Um, the only qualifier I need to explain is my name doesn't have an I. So it's T-S-H <laughs> and then a weird last name too, but it's Tish Oxenreiter. That's where you can find me. And Keith, I have to say, I'm really grateful for your work too. I know that um, I know that surprises you, but really and truly, it's been a bomb because you, you have you have surrounded yourself with such great encouraging people and you ask good questions and you host, you just provide a really good space for people to share their stories and these stories need to be told. And so thank you for what you're doing really and truly. I mean, it, you're, you're saving lives probably <laughs> you're bringing people into the church and I'm grateful. Ah, uh, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's that, that means a lot. And I don't want to get too emotional here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And I'll put links to your stuff in the show notes so they can figure out how to spell your name and find your stuff. <laughs> Sounds good. Also, oh gosh, Tish, thank you so much for being here. I really mean it. God bless you and the work you do for the church. Uh, it's fantastic. And, and really, truly thank you for being here and, and the, those kind words. Thank, thank you. You, so much. you too.